again, he leaves his right hand at his eyebrow all the time. It's like it's Velcro stuck there. So he's saying yok yok dua. He means sway your body to the outside so that you're basically winding up for those body punches. Winding up should not be your arm. Your arm doesn't wind up. Your body winds up. It's like you're twisting your body in order to generate the springing power to spring back in the opposite direction. It's like a coil. This looks better. Like it, it looks fast and strong. So I can be like, I'm awesome on the pads. But the reason it's not awesome is I'm watching my legs and my legs are not doing what his legs are doing, which is constantly stepping towards that front foot and having flexibility in my own front foot in order to be able to go forward and backwards really easily. I'm cheating. I'm like throwing punches really hard and so they like generate a little bit of power. But if I weren't throwing hard and actually just bringing my legs with me, I would have more power with less effort. So he wants me to like dodge underneath. And because I've dodged underneath, I've kind of like swung my body out to the right. So I should throw the right cross first and then hook and cross. That's what I was talking about, about how you're basically like using the coil and the recoil together. <laughs> so because I dodged underneath and came to the right, I throw my right cross. If you go the opposite way, you throw your left hip. Look at his legs. It's all in the legs. This is the this is the like seductive thing about learning from someone where you like pay attention to the wrong thing. <coughs> if you're learning from a boxer, you're like, I'm gonna watch his hands. Because it's punches. That's like watching a bullet to figure out how to aim a gun. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> like it's all everyone who watches anything about actual marksmen, they talk about how it's all in the squeeze. Accuracy and firing a bullet is all in breathing and the squeeze. I'm sitting here watching a bullet. He's a puncher, so you're like, look where his hands are. And that's why I'm like throwing punches hard, but not actually having any flexibility because the squeeze is in his legs and his knees. That's how he generates all his power and distance. Look at how close his front leg is getting to me. He's holding pads, he's not even hitting me. And he's putting his feet, like, right on my feet. This stuff is important. I'm not a kicker, so I don't work on this. It's like an underdeveloped thing that's super basic that, honestly, if I worked on it more, I might be more of a kicker. So he's making a point about how much on your toe you get. You see, you don't want to exaggerate how much on your toe you are because you lose balance. You don't want to be flat-footed because you lose power and flexibility. It's this like pori pori, which means like just enough, like baby bear, of coming up with your heel off the ground to have flexibility in the foot. Ah, I blocked there. So see, he throws me and I can catch myself and immediately pop up that block. Not spinning around, <laughs> but catching yourself and throwing the block up. See how you can like catch your balance right, right at the moment where you can intercept that kick. If you're the person who's thrown the kick and you're kicking, if someone has the ability to do that, you can always just kick them in the back because there's no way that they can block it. But it's working on the ways that you can protect yourself. We end up working on this a lot, so like buckle in. This is really, really brilliant. You could fight an entire fight with basically a jab and a left knee. We work on this quite a bit, but it actually takes a lot of um, correction to figure out the distance, the timing, the snapping, having power on the jab as well as the knee so that neither is a throwaway, this kind of thing. You can see with that left elbow, how the step forward is the same as the step forward on a jab. You're basically coming straight, straight into your opponent's stance. 
See how he even throws a little bit of a fake jab first and then the right comes after it? It's the same as a one-two, but instead of a cross, it's your elbow because you've shortened that distance. So putting punches and elbows together is really nice in terms of a leg as you're um, eating distance closing in on your opponent they just kind of flow together as you're getting closer if your opponent backs up just stay with the punches because your distance is staying the same but if they stop like if you stun them with something and you close the distance and you're a little bit too close for a punch an elbow is just right there with perfect power oh look at look at the elbows being tucked in they're not touching his ribs but they're kind of like stuck in a little bit I'm asking him how the hook comes around. Like, does it go behind someone's guard? Or do you just go ahead and hit their guard? And he says it depends on the distance you have between you and the opponent. He's like, if they're coming towards you, when you throw that hook, it's going to go behind behind their guard. But if they're farther away from you or if they're punching, you can actually hook over that punch. Mat, mat in Thai is um, a punch. It actually means like a fist, but like mat. So he's saying mat hook means like a hook punch. Oh, he's showing here how to block with your, uh, like tucking your elbow up. And your shoulder keeps you from turning all the way? Yeah. Over here. You can see my toe. Yeah. And I tend. That point he's making about leading with his chest is what Karahat teaches, and the strength in his body is something Gisela makes a point about all the time. Like your target is too far. You try to reach. He's talking about extension. Does your chest go first or do your hips go first? Together. Okay. And hang it like this. There. See? You can hang like a statue. He said like a statue. Your body your becomes one like piece. All one piece also, or do you have a bend in it? Ooh. Now what you can do? Bang! Ooh. You slap <laughs> like that. That's Samart, I see it. Ooh. Said Samart snaps his kicks. Actually, in the Muay Thai library, Samart teaches how he snaps his kick at the very end. He like, has a arrow bong at the end of his foot. He says, tall people jab easy. So if you try to kick on a jabber, that's no good. See how he just crushed my jab and took all my breathing space <laughs> in a single movement? Look at how he waits for me. I was absolutely astounded at how his weight was never, ever back. Even when he was on his back leg, he was never leaning back. So here he's saying that his style is to have that racer back foot so that he can constantly come forward. See if his foot is flat, he can't really push me. <laughs> then he puts his heel up and when he pushes me, it's like the Hulk clap. <laughs> I just go like, I was not, I was not faking how hard he pushed me across the ring. He said, 
I was able to do this because I practiced like that long, long, long. And I kept trying to get him to tell me what his practicing was in order to build his feeling around how the power is coming up through his foot, his knee, and his hip. He told me this many times. He's like, your power comes from your leg and your knee and your hip. Like, it's rising up from the ground. It's a very, like, Tai Chi explanation. And then look at how his elbow is even out a little bit as he's punching. He says, when you punch and your, like, hand comes up a little bit, there's no power. So he brings his elbow up a little bit so that when he hits me, there's this, like, acceleration on the end to just shove me backwards. But he's not pushing at all. And he says it's just feeling. Like, you have to feel where that power is coming from. He says, in order to be ready, you have to have balance. But you, al you almost have to break apart. He's making a single movement, but you have to break it apart to understand how his weight is transferring because you can't see it. It's so smooth. See how he took a second step? Obviously, you can see it. You see his foot go forward. When you're in front of him, you can't see that. He's just all of a sudden like seven inches closer to you than he was the first time he hit you. It's crazy. So now he's just messing with me with his hands. He's like flicking them in my face in order to mess with me in my lower half. This was something he was incredibly good at is that he would get me very distracted by whatever was happening with his hands and then he would be teeping my legs at the same time. <laughs> I'm trying to just float my block the way that he does to like slow him down, but he just keeps moving around it. Like he's totally not perturbed by that obstacle at all. Like how water will just flow around the rock that's in the way. It's like the knee is not a problem because he just uses every strike other than the one that that's blocking. I was telling him I really liked this move, so we're working on it a little bit, which is that blocking the hook with your forearm and then uh, snatching the neck on the inside like as a crossover. So with my right arm, I'm blocking his hook, and then with my left arm, I'm reaching across his body to grab the other side of his neck, and then you can just slam with your knee as you're stepping in. He had a really nice, uh, where he put his hand on the head is very similar to Yodkun Pan in terms of like, you're not actually grabbing the head, but you're putting weight on just the right spot so that you can just, it's like sinking a balloon underwater or something. Just the pressure of your hand manipulates it a lot. See how he's bringing his knee up to kind of thwart me and then he'll use that same leg to like teep my legs or kind of move around. I'm trying to do the same thing with my knee, but I become incredibly stagnant when I do it, whereas he uses it to kind of be a um, diversion so that he can do everything else that he's trying to do. There I tried to hook his foot the way he does me. But... So here he's explaining to me, if you're self car and you're facing another self-car, then you use the back car, leg when you're then you use your back leg. Yeah. But if you're southpaw and you're facing orthodox, if it's mixed stance, then you want to be going towards this open side. See how if we have mixed stance, so we're front foot to front foot, if I try to use my front teeth, it's very easy for him to catch it. So he's like, instead of keeping my belly, keep my leg. He says only Sanchai will reach down and grab that teeth because he's a trickster, but it's dangerous. He's saying, don't don't bother keeping the body in the stance. Keep the leg, because it's right there. And you can interrupt all of the kicks to the open side. He's showing me how that works. He's just barely touching my leg, but he's hitting me right above the knee. He's saying that one of his um, students, when people come to kick him, he just hits that front leg and it destroys kickers. So if you're facing a kicker, go after that front leg, especially if you're mixed stance. <laughs> he's showing how there's pain in it, that face that he's making, and it's true. If you hit right above the knee, it buckles the knee backwards. You're not nailing it hard. You're not, like, injuring somebody, but you're 
throwing off their ability to throw that kick at all. And now, since you've stopped them and you're closing in, this front elbow just comes straight up. He's saying that Mung Tai, PK Sanchai Jim, uh, is really good at this elbow. He's been called the modern day elbow hunter, um, Mung Tai, but he's not anything like Yotun Khan, who's in the library, but he does throw a lot of elbows. I was discovering while throwing this front elbow that I was kind of veering off to the side, and it was about how I rotated my shoulders, which is what he talks about on this kick as well. One of the reasons you keep your guard up so high on the kick is not only so that you're protected on the end of it and you can really be assured of your kick, but it also controls the kick in a really nice way to control your upper body at the same time. So here he's having me do a one, two, three, four punch and then push his head and elbow off of it. So this is another way in which Ajahn Surat is teaching how to close distance, but he also has this like pushing against to off balance the moment before you go. I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if during his time uh, there were boxers as well. This part I really liked. I've never seen this before, and I didn't understand it the first time he showed me. I throw the kick, and then I step forward with the kick that I just threw and land my straight cross. So you basically, I'm out of my own stance, and I kick, and then instead of bringing that kick back, you land on it and step forward to land your cross. Here's that pivot. See how he's trying to get me to use the right timing as he's coming through? I kind of paused because I was in an awkward position, so he knew I wasn't going to be able to move. So here again, now he's getting me to throw two kicks because he could see that I keep trying to do it. But he's throwing a counter at me too. He's like, if you want to throw two, you have to be ready for your opponent to kick back at you as well. See how he just leans his weight forward to get me to teep him? Like, he's not yelling teep. He's not, like, going on one leg. He's just leaning his weight forward to see whether my eyes can catch it or not. And I like this too, he has this double teep where you're like walking forward, but on the second teep to make it more powerful, you teep sideways, you turn your knee and end up landing with your foot sideways. Samar, who's Payakarun but trained at Sityotong, he has these sideways teeps, they're super strong. But Krunoi is teaching me to use that on the second one. So the first one is like a jab, with my front leg, because timing-wise, you want to be really fast. And then the second one, you're stepping down with that teeth and going sideways for a really powerful one as you come forward. 